All we want is Jupiter at night before an audience live on the internet. Yeah. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Jupiter at Night. My name is Chris. My name is Jeremy. Yo there, Jamie. Hi there, Chris. Tonight, we're doing... You now, okay. Now, you guys know this is the last week of Jupiter at Night. If you didn't know that, go back and watch Tuesday night's episode. We'll wait. Okay, welcome back. That should have been enough time, yeah. Well, they hit pause, I assume. Right, of course. And hopefully, they didn't just leave it playing. That would use a lot of resources. Mm -hmm. So, we talked about our plans for the future of Jupiter at Night. New shows on the network were announced. All kinds of great stuff, so mm -hmm. go check that out. Tonight, we're going to continue this thread of the last week of Jupiter Night and wrapping things up, some covering some stories that we found interesting, that we liked, things like that. Well, basically, a continuation of stuff that we've already done a episodes follow about. A yeah, follow-up. Absolutely. Yeah. And tonight, we're going to talk about planets, aliens, and Area 51. Well, we did an episode uh, way long ago called UFOs Are Real, where it was all about the declassified information that had come out with the, mm. uh, was it the Air Force or didn't, or the... Air Force. I think it was Air Force. CIA depends on which. Basically U.S. military yeah, all over yeah. the place. Yeah, and, and we covered in, in detail some of the information that they had about UFOs and junk like that. Yeah, they came out. A whole group of them came out and said, well, UFOs are real. Now, here's the details kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. And it was an interesting thing. And we covered all the deets on that in our episode that came out on 928 of 2010. That was a long time ago. It was, man. Well, I, like well I said, now we got new information yeah. about... Well, it's not actually UFOs, but no. Chris has been reading a really great oh book. Oh my gosh, you guys. Let me tell you about this book. It tells you all about sort of the ins and outs and secrets of Area 51. Things from uh, the late 90s and the early 2000s and the later 2000s that have been declassified. Interviews with people and all these kinds of things. A lot of interesting things. Like, a lot of people, I think, know that Area 51 or that whole area down there had been used for uh, nuclear tests. Mm -hmm. Here's a, we're showing a video of an underground nuclear test. Which is actually from India, but the same the stuff yep. happened in Area it's, 51. It's the same. Like, this is just a quick visual we can find to demonstrate. But because yeah, it, it's the internet. It's the internet and everything looks identical. Yep. On the internet. <laughs> um, and, and one of the things that I found absolutely and totally compelling about Area 51 51 is it's just its total scope, scale, and size. Mm -hmm. The operations there of building secret military jets, things that were being built to sort of defy radar detection, like really, like, um, oh, one was really interesting. They called it the ox cart, J-Man. And the ox cart was That's a, a terrible name. Is that a plane? I, I don't get why they would call it the ox cart either, to be honest with you. That's but a, for it's supposed to be like a stealthy... Top they, secret. They had some other better names too. They had some better names before it and what after. What the Blackbird? You know, well, like isn't that, that a great name for? A yeah, that was one. All of right. Them. Well, okay. that was one they came up with later. But uh, no, I, this. Uh, oh, I fact, get it. They were trying to throw off the Ruskies. Oh, maybe you call know. it ox cart, and everybody's like, "Well, that, well, thing that doesn't really fly." Care about that, no, <laughs> no. The ox cart was uh, made out of titanium, and it, the whole purpose was it was trying to avoid detection by radar, and they thought titanium would help them accomplish this. Hmm. One of the interesting things that came out of this, though, is the amount of titanium they needed to build such a thing could only really be acquired from Russia itself. So the CIA made some sort of backroom deal, which is still classified, to get titanium out of Russia to build this crazy spy plane so that it could spy on Russia. <laughs> <laughs> Only in the government, right? I mean, right. that just is crazy. <laughs> um, and, and National Geographic has a uh, documentary out right now. I'm showing you some stills from it. Mm -hmm. Extremely compelling stuff. There's and a link in the show notes. You can actually watch the whole thing on YouTube. Yeah. So check it out. It's, it's really, really interesting stuff. And there is also some information in this book that I've been reading regarding... The UFO landing crashes at, the, at the Roswell. Roswell incident. Yeah, back in 1948 I, or 47, 47, I believe. Yeah, 47. Okay. Yeah, there was the Roswell crash, and the gal, Didn't the author. Give it away. I don't want to. I I almost want to just kind of point people to the book because it's kind of a big part of the book. Mm -hmm. But she interviews with people like the deputy director of the CIA of the time and people who worked there, admit the administrator of the facility, people that were there reverse engineering different types of technology from around the world, mm -hmm. and gets them on the record to say what was going on. With the exception of one person who who remains anonymous, um, it's really compelling information. And and I've been reading this. It's called Area 51, and we'll have links in the show notes if you want to grab it and. Yeah, you can pick up a, either an audible version or a Amazon physical yeah. copy and stuff like that. Uh, but also in the show notes, we've got links to some recently declassified pictures. Mm -hmm. And do you mind if I show a couple of them? Yeah, no. I, they're I, declassified. They Why would I mind? That's true. They are declassified now. Um, and I, I guess some of this stuff has just, just recently been shown. Like, if you watch this National Geographic documentary, some of the stuff they talk about, and, and in this book as well, they actually go out, out of their way to point out, this is the first time anyone's ever 
been told this. This mm-hmm. is this has never been revealed until this, this the moment. initial and only publishing of this information yeah. to date. Um, and I don't know. It's just absolutely amazing the culture there. They had they would fly people in depending on when they're working on projects. They have to set up and people have to live at Area Fifty One. Mm-hmm. There were thousands of workers. There still are thousands of workers at Area Fifty One. They would have they to fly in to jet chairs. They were experimenting with different all kinds of military advanced military aircraft. Essentially, this was and is the U.S. government's R and D area for uh, military weaponry. Um, here's a, here's a shot of the ox cart. Uh, um, titanium spy plane. Oh, I could barely see it. It's so stealthy. It's funny, J Man. It's actually <laughs> upside down because they have to test both the bottom and the top for to radar signatures. For radar signatures, yeah. Huh. And what's funny is the Russians were so interested in what the U.S. government was doing at Area 51 that they set up a series of satellites to fly over at different times to try to get shots of what was going on. And the workers there ended up struggling with the fact that they would bring something out to work on it and put it up on what they called the pylon, and they would try to get. Um, you know, a couple of hours working, and they'd have to haul it all back in before they could get very far. Before the satellites came overhead. Because the Russians would come and get shots of it. So they started doing things like working at night and and, and other things. But part of the issue was as as technology was advancing so quickly at this time, Mm -hmm. the Russians equipped their satellites and their airplanes with uh, infrared cameras. Oh, of course. So then the Area 51 guys had to start not only taking the ships down, but covering up the shadows that they cast, because the shadows would be uh, cooler in the hot desert sun, and the infrared... Uh, cameras overhead would be able to pick up the temperature difference and get the outline of the ship. Jeez. Yeah, pretty wicked stuff. And so then they'd start doing things. You know, crazy I realize things. that this was a very dangerous place in our history with the, you know, the imminent threat of war at, at all times, but pretty epic. Kind of huh? cool to live during that time. Yeah. Because when the, there's all this n- spy stuff going on. I agree. I mean, that, that would have been kind of fo- cool to be involved in that. They, uh, they they talk a lot about all the little tricks they'd come up with to try to fool them, like uh, they'd paint fake outlines of airplanes and add heaters to them and things like that. So they looked like hot engines. But uh, it's interesting the the book that I'm reading and some of the information that I've been I've been coming across is like if you think if you think the uh, alien crash landings at Roswell are the big story of Area 51, then you are just scratching the surface. That is just one of the minor threads in the entire history of Area 51. Really interesting. So it's including c- basically that Area 51 one launched the uh, our domestic nuclear program yeah yeah and well and really uh all of the radar invading advanced spy technology we have today including potentially now this was just a rumor i was reading online but uh they in the interview they said you know like these these stealth helicopters they sent to go get Osa- osama bin laden and one mm-hmm. of them crashed um they believe they were also developed at area 51 like the, w- all the one of they ended up having to scuttle over there. Yeah, right? yeah. All of our super secret stuff that we build that won't be declassified for thirty years is is built out of there, and there are thousands of workers up there. Mm-hmm. Amazing. Um, anyway, so go go check out the show notes for links uh, to the Audible book and the uh, that's the one I've been listening to, or the Amazon book. Both are affiliate links if you want to. I thought I mentioned that the the original author. Um, narrates her Audible book. And yeah. it's actually pretty good. It is They've good. They've got like a, a two-minute preview on Audible that you can listen to. It's a 16-hour book, and so it's great if you're a commuter or something like that. Mm-hmm. And I've been listening to it at night, so it's yeah. pretty cool. Now, why don't we follow up on... Uh, Since we're talking about UFOs, right? Yeah, and I think one <laughs> of the most promising shows we did on the whole extraterrestrial life is the... Uh, Planets that were really similar to Earth that were discovered recently. Extrasolar planets. Some people call them exoplanets and stuff like that. We did a. Uh, That's adorable. We did an episode that we titled "Planets Armina" yeah. because there was this big press conference that the guy that discovered this basically came out and said, "Yes, I believe there's life on this planet." Turns out that that was pretty much a bunch of bunk. Ah, oh, too bad. To kind of get you excited about the concept of it. So this we did but this episode on October. Uh, yeah, I got our I got our attention. Right back on October 6 of 2010, we did this episode. Yeah. Now that particular planet, like I said, is kind of bunk for a couple different reasons. It looks like it's probably uh, it's tidally locked, which would mean that the living temperatures of the planet are either too hot or too cold, and there's all just this very little band uh, that could be potentially livable. Well, probably not but, likely to have evolved life. But isn't that what they say? Then they go down to the deep parts of the ocean here, and they find like... Oh, sure. I, when I say not likely to support life, I mean like life as we know it's it. It's not best case scenario yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. Okay. Right. Well. But, you know, from that same group that was that was checking out things like Planet Zarmina, um, well, you guys have probably heard about the Kepler project, that we, the Kepler telescope that we've mentioned, I think, kind of just offhandedly. Yeah. We haven't, like, done a whole episode on it or anything, but that Kepler project are the ones that came out and said that they discovered over 1,200 candidates for extrasolar planets Whoa. within our local galaxy. So that means planets that would likely potentially, that are potentially have Potentially Earth-like, that huh. they, they uh, habit a region around their 
sun's orbit that could be that could support li- liquid water. That, that we, didn't we call Goldilocks it, zone? We got Mars. We got Mar- Heather on the show, and yeah. she said there's like a sweet spot that yeah. they could be in. Yeah, they call it the Goldilocks zone. Okay, not that's too hot, that's not too cold. Oh, that's the Goldilocks. Yeah. Oh, that's. <laughs> yeah, I get it from the porridge. Right, I got you. So David. they came out that these guys on the Kepler project and listen to this: uh, roughly one out of every thirty-seven to every seventy sun-like stars in the sky might harbor an alien Earth. That's a pretty good statistic because hey. that means that within our galaxy, that's potentially billions of planets. Dude, Star Trek could happen. That yeah. means Star Trek could happen. That, that means the Alpha totally Quadrant happen. is banging. So because they discovered all these, they started pointing some of their uh, spectrometry science and stuff at this to try to discover some of the... It uh, would be nice if we had SETI. Just saying. It would be. Just saying. They're still working on it. It's just slower now because they shut down the big Allen array. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so they're pointing their spectrometers at it to see what they can get like with in the reflections and stuff? Yeah. They're also doing more um, fine-tuning of their findings to find out like... Uh, okay. Some of the discoveries that they've already made are like one of these planets has the density of solid lead. Now, when they were first looking at this planet, it was surprising because it, when it passes in front of the sun, they can tell, oh, good, good picture of it. Oh, I they see. They can see the size of it, basically, in, as it passes in front of their sun. And it's not much bigger than Earth. I think only like 60% larger. Mm-hmm. But based on the amount that it pulls the sun as it orbits around it, they can tell that it's eight times as massive as our planet. As based, planet on that, based on how it's affecting the based sun. Based on how much it wobbles the sun as it orbits around it. Amazing that we can look at stars across the galaxy and see that a planet is pulling them. Yeah. I mean, well, or we assume it's a planet. It could be... It could just be a really big chunk of, you know, metal. Or a black hole. Or... Maybe it's an orbiting black hole. Like a supervillain. I'm calling it an orbiting black hole that contains the base of a supervillain. Okay. (laughs) Nice, dude. Nice. I like how we collaborated on that one. Yeah, that's science right there. (laughs) You know, another interesting thing about that planet, though, is it orbits the sun once every 18 hours. It's just zipping around that sun. That's all about... Yeah. That's a short day. <laughs> now, uh, is this something I was supposed to show? Because I didn't, I didn't catch what. Okay, so this is interesting. Um, each one of these colored balls, and yeah. Earth is behind my head there, um, are within the the orbit of a sun out there, a, a, a star out there, within an orbit similar to the distance that Mercury is from okay. our planet. But look at the size of all those. Yeah. The si- based on the Earth size is of small. this. Based on the size of these six planets and how close they are to their sun, it has completely obliterated every theory out there about oh, the formation of planets. No kidding. Simply put, this can't happen under our current models. No kidding. This is the kind of science that people are doing just by pointing a, uh, a, a telescope at another star and saying, well, it wobbles this much. Here are some planets around it. So, I mean, it's, it's obliterating science, left and right. Oh, They're just man. discovering brand new things. And you now guys they have to come up are going to be so busy on SciBite. Yeah. <laughs> See, I had a little plug there. That was nice. That was kind of ridiculous. I'm sorry. I'm just excited for side oh, oh, I think you'll find this one fascinating. They've also come up with a new way of measuring shadows on alien planets in order to determine whether or not there are forests on the surface of that planet. Like How, light years away. Doesn't that seem like doesn't that seem like you're taking good odds? It seems like all of this stuff. Honestly, it seems like the pulling of the moon or the pulling on the sun, the shadows, the reflections of light, it all seems like you're taking a really good guess. You are. It, as we've taken to saying on SciBite, it's close enough for science. And you're playing the odds here. Yeah, you are playing I mean, the odds. You're there's like, only one exoplanet so far discovered that has above a 90% chance of actually existing. I mean, what you're, what you're working on here is like, there's very few things that we have identified that could cause these effects to happen, so we believe it is one of these things. Right. That's literally what they're going on here. Yeah. I mean, it's, it is best guess scenarios, but I mean, so far, most of the stuff has turned out to be correct. All right. So if they keep going with this, who knows what they could discover out there? Well, we uh, this 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 episode turned out being full, just packed full of awesome links, including some of the visuals I've been showing. This is a gallery of artist renditions of some of the exoplanets that have so far been discovered, and they're awesome and pretty. Yeah. and a lot of these are big enough; they come in all. Oh, dude, versions. go back to that one because that one I just want to mention real offhandedly uh, is over eight billion years older than our sun. The I don't know how the they figured that out. Is? The planet there. How can they figure that out? Eight billion years before Earth. Sorry, not the oldest sun. known planet is a primeval world, twelve point seven billion years old. old, that formed more than eight billion years before Earth, and only two billion years after the Big Bang. I don't know how they figured this stuff out, but can you imagine if life had evolved on that planet? It would be eight billion years older than us, and huge. Well, yeah, we have more space. Yeah, I could have a bigger place with a bigger yard. Yeah, I'm just saying that'd be kind of nice. Mm-hmm. You wouldn't have another house sitting in your front yard. Yeah, I mean it's you know I mean well 
Or probably not. We'd probably people like to bone, so we'd probably just fill all that up anyways. <laughs> yeah. We'd just be boning more, is what it is. Right. So. Yep, yep. All right. Okay. That's human nature for you. Uh, now, uh, one other. But there's. I look at this one here. I just. I just like the colors in this one. I think we should have set this as a background. All right. You know, these, some of these are we'll really super high res. On Cybite. Yeah. There you go. Some of these are super high res, and some of them are kind of small. So, yeah. but check them out in the show notes if you want to grab yourself a background mm-hmm. or something. Anything else you want to cover, Jamin? No, I think that's a good update for this. That is a good update. Yeah. All right, everyone. We'll be curious to know your thoughts on the whole Area Fifty One thing. Have you had a chance to go grab the book again? The book that I recommend, you can get it anywhere. But I just I've been listening to the audio book, Area Fifty One: An Uncensored History of America's Top Secret Military Base. I absolutely have been loving this book. Mm-hmm. It's been a great book. So I'm probably gonna end up picking it up too. Good man. So you guys got to check that out and let me know what you think if you had a chance to mm-hmm. read it. And if you're interested in the whole extra solar thing, I've got links. You can check out the latest on the Kepler project and all that great fancy stuff. Yeah, buddy. All right, everyone. Well, thanks so much for tuning in to, mo- to tonight's episode of Jupiter and Night. And tomorrow's. Now, tomorrow is the last night of Jupiter at Night in its current form. Just saying that. <laughs> so tune in for that over at jblive.tv at 8 p.m. Pacific. And uh, join the chat room and hang out with the live chat peeps who tell us how... Oh, uh, you fixed the shot. You I didn't have it last time. I didn't have it last time. Yeah. I wanted to make sure I had a chat shot. All right. And there it is. There's Mars Base right there because we're talking about science Yay. stuff. So there you go. <laughs> and uh, you guys can join us and uh, hang out in the chat room and have a good time with us. Mm-hmm. All right, everyone. Well, thanks so much for watching tonight, and we'll see you tomorrow night.